there's always a juggling act when you're trying to explain some concepts that can go pretty deep, pretty complicated, fairly quickly in an introduction kind of a course. This video is, you're going to be watching me juggle here. We're going to talk about the technologies of the internet. This is how the internet runs. The internet is not just one technology. In fact, what we have are a whole bunch of rules, protocols that run different aspects of the internet. You f have tons of different technologies out there. We're going to focus on some of the big services, big protocols that you are familiar with, even though you may not know you're familiar with. We're going to cover TCP IP, HTTP, HTTPS. We're actually going to look at that in another video. FTP, SMTP, POP3, and Telnet. Again, each of these we're going to scratch the surface of. When I'm teaching a A plus certification course or a Network Plus course, we look at these in much more detail. But for an intro course, a BCIS course, or just learn about technologies course, we really don't need to go too deep. We need to give you a consumer level of understanding about what these things are. So let's first begin with the big blanket that covers a whole bunch of this stuff, the big protocol that runs the internet more or less. And that would be TCP IP. TCP is Transmission Control Protocol, IP is Internet Protocol. What this is, it's the glue that holds the internet together. This is how data is sent around the internet. It's a suite of tools that have rules on how they get around the internet. What we also find is that TCP IP is not just found on the internet anymore. We have a lot of local networks, uh, business networks, things like that, that use TCP IP as their default rule book. The next protocol, HTTP, HTTPS, we're going to take a look at that in our separate video just on the World Wide Web. That's going to be video 4.4, which we'll take a look at after this video. The next one is known as File Transfer Protocol, or FTP for short. It's not a flower delivery company. This is a networking protocol used to send data from one host to another host. What we typically do here is we're sending files over, we're sending data over, we're sending files. So for example, I would use FTP a lot when I did web development. I would create my website on my computer and then I would have to upload these files to a server to have those displayed on the internet. And you put those files up there by using FTP, File Transfer Protocol. Most people who use the internet probably never have to worry about FTP. But now you know what it is and what, what it's out there. So if you ever hear the term, you're familiar with it. There are some great programs out there that you can get to do FTP. For example, most web browsers support some basic level of FTP uh, work. I wouldn't recommend using a web browser for, if you have to do anything major with FTP, but it does support it. I personally like FileZilla. FileZilla is a uh, free program, very powerful, good functionality, easy to use, as far as FTP clients go. You have Qt FTP, Smart FTP, Cyberduck. There's a whole bunch of different FTP programs out there. So FTP is a way to upload transfer files from one host to another host. The next one you are definitely familiar with, even though you probably have never heard of what runs it, and that would be SMTP and POP3. This is how your email works. And to make matters complicated, Email doesn't work with just one protocol. We have one set of rules to send an email, and we have another set of rules to receive email. POP3, or POP Post Office Protocol version 3, is used for receiving emails. This is the things that you have to configure. So if you ever have a email client, so for example, my website's mrfordsclass.net. Um, another site I have, which I don't really use very often, mrfordsclass.com. I have email accounts with both. It's not a friendly way to configure my emails. I just can't put that in my computer and it goes, although it is getting easier. I have to configure different portions of it. So if I wanted to receive emails, I would have to configure my POP3 uh, protocol, my POP3 client. To send emails, I would have to use simple mail transfer protocol, otherwise known as SMTP. I keep the differences in mind by thinking of SM as send mail. This is your send mail 
protocol. It gets the mail out. So if you ever are trying to configure your own email, for example, if you have, again, a, a smartphone, a tablet, a computer, and you're trying to configure your own personal email account, sometimes you can receive emails, but you can't send emails. You get an error there. Or you can send an email, and you get an error message on receiving emails. It's because your SMTP and your POP haven't been configured properly. You can have one right and the other one wrong, or both right or both wrong. There's another way um, that has more features than POP3, which would be Internet Message Access Protocol, IMAP. So those are different ways to have emails sent. Some of the more popular email programs that you can have, and I'm sure you've run into one of these or more than one of these at work, which would be Microsoft Outlook. This is part of the Office Suite. We talked about that in the previous lesson. This is part, again, of the Office Suite. You usually have to buy this separately or your company provides it. Outlook Express was built into Windows, so this was the default for many people for many years. If you're on a Mac, we have Mail. It does take some adjustment to go from a PC Outlook to Mail. Uh, now that I'm in Mail, I, I like it. It doesn't have all the features of Outlook, but I really don't want those for that email client. And then if you want to you know, be cool and be all hipster kind of guy or gal, you can go Mozilla Thunderbird. Mozilla Thunderbird, Mozilla, also the people who bring you Firefox, have an email program, very powerful, and you can use that as well. Uh, that is both uh, cross-platform, so you can use it on a Mac as well as a PC. Um, Linux people, if you're using Linux, you know if it works for you or not. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, the other way, which is mo what most of us do, and that's what's uh, known as webmail. We use webmail. These are cloud-based uh, email things. We'll talk about cloud later on in this series where you are logging on to a separate site to check your email. This is a very popular method. They're, for the most part, free. Some examples would be Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail. Um, Gmail, I would say, is probably one of the most popular email uh, things out there. Again, it is completely free. Something you have to realize is when you use web-based mail like Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo Mail, you are allowing them to data mine your information and to then serve you advertisements that they think that you're going to like. So if you're okay with that, which I have a Gmail account, my wife has a Gmail account, then that's fine. But you also have to realize that they are looking at your, your emails. They're looking for keywords. They're looking for ways to advertise you to get you to buy things. Also be aware that a lot of your uh, email things. For example, I told you about MrFordsClass.net, MrFordsClass.com. I'm also able to access my email cloud-based via my hosting company. So, but that's not what we're really talking about as far as email, um, cloud email things. There are some good and bads, like I said earlier. One of the good things, and this is why you really should have a, a web-based email, is that it's not ISP dependent. So, for example, I was in Virginia. I had Cox Communication. Now that I'm back in Texas, I have um, a Comcast. If I had an email associated with my ISP, when I moved, I would probably lose it. Now, some they're getting better about this, but I would still have a dependent email on who I had for a service provider. When I left that service provider, I would lose my email. Now, imagine if all your friends, all your family, everybody knows you by that email address, all of a sudden you're gone, you can't access an email address anymore. This is one of the reasons why I really say you should get a Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo Mail because it stays with you for your entire life. You can have it in college, you can have it as a professional, you have it, it's yours for all time. Here's a suggestion, however. If you are looking for work, if you're looking for a job, be aware of what your email is so if you have a email and you're looking for a job and your email is sexybunny94, you don't want that on a resume, okay? You can make multiple emails. In fact, this is the second good part is that you can use it for junk mail. So you can have an email, right, that you use for people who know you, your friends, you know, maybe you made, you know, sexybunny94 or whatever, when you were in school, you can still keep that email. Your friends can still send you emails at that account. You can make a separate email account, you know, professional email person, 
and use that one for your business life. So you can have multiple emails. In fact, more people are having multiple emails that they use. Uh, so that's a good way to do it as well. You, they're free. And like I said, they're easy to make multiple accounts. Bad thing, they can be anonymous. So this could be good or bad, depending on, I guess, your point of view. If you are in law enforcement, it can be bad because people can send things anonymously via webmail if they set it up right. Security concerns on public computers. If you're using a public computer and you're logging onto your mail, be aware if you don't have the settings right or if you save something or if there's a virus or keylogger on that computer, you could be giving away the keys to your email account. So be very, very careful all the time on a public computer. And many of the webmail providers, again, mine your data for advertisements, which I talked about a second ago. So definitely good and bads with uh, webmail. I have webmail, recommend it. You kind of have to have it in this world. The next one is UberGeek, and that would be Telnet. Telnet creates what we call a virtual terminal. So I'm here again in Humble. Let's say that I want to log into a computer out in Kansas somewhere. I can Telnet into that computer. I create a virtual terminal on my computer so it looks like I'm actually working on that computer. This allows you to connect to other devices anywhere in the world. I've taken a couple of Cisco courses. Cisco is more advanced, geeky, nerd uh, network stuff. And one of the basic skills you have to learn for Cisco is you have to be able to Telnet into a router. Case in point, let's say that you're in Florida and a router goes down in Nebraska. You're not going to go fly to Nebraska to go fix it. You're going to be at your terminal in Florida. You're going to Telnet connect virtually to that, that network device, to that router, and configure it from where you're at in Florida. So Telnet. Now, if you want to have some fun with this, you can do this. And all computers pretty much support Telnet. It's kind of a standard built-in feature. Do this. Open up a command line on your computer. We've talked about command line in previous videos. So if you're on a Windows, start run CMD. If you're on a Mac, applications, utilities, terminals. If you remember from my previous video, I said terminal can be dangerous. Don't worry, you're not going to break anything on this one. And you want to type in the following thing. Telnet towel dot blinken lights dot nl what you're going to see is pretty cool and they they actually put this on youtube somebody created the entire star wars episode four right the new hope where all of his old timers that was our first star wars movie they created the entire star wars movie using ascii they created the entire star wars movie using text it's so cool um but check it out it is fun it is free and you get to say you've done some Telnet. Finally, two other technologies I want to talk about is our news groups and VoIP, Voice over IP. News groups are, you need a newsreader program to access news groups. News groups are discussion groups. I would suggest that unless you have a specific reason to use news groups, not to use news groups. News groups, from my experience, have become kind of the underbelly of the internet. Now, there are Usenets where uh, educators and academics can go and they have their own special news groups where they can share information and papers. But news groups in general, for the general public on the internet, I would avoid. You're going to run into all sorts of nasty stuff. Viruses, malware, just... Don't go on news groups unless you really, really, really know what you're doing. The final one is VoIP, voice over IP. This is exciting. This is why phone service got real cheap real fast. This enables video calls. We're talking future stuff here. Video calls and video conferencing over a network. You need a high-speed connection. VoIP is a collection of protocols we're not going to get into, but it allows you to have video conferencing or just telephone calls over the internet. And you can use things like Skype, AOL Instant Messenger, Google Plus Hangouts, Yahoo Messenger. There's tons of other ones where you can have live face-to-face -face chats with people. Uh, when I was doing training on the road, when I was training the Bureau, the FBI, and the DEA, did a lot of training. I would connect my laptop to Skype and have face-to-face -face conversations with my family. In fact, my uh, my parents live in Florida. We live in Texas. 
uh, you know, vacation, not vacations, but holidays don't always work as far as visiting each other. We had one Thanksgiving where we had a laptop running Skype the entire day, both ends. We got to see each other. It was like we were there together. So that's VoIP, voice over IP. And the reason why I say it made phone networks get really cheap really fast is because the cable companies started to introduce this stuff as part of their, hey, you've got a television. We're using IP anyways. you got an internet connection. We can make you have a phone conversation over your internet provider. The phone companies were going, oh, crap. We didn't know we could do that. And so you used to be charged per the minute for like long distance phone calls, stuff like that. Here's VoIP. It's free. Here's Skype. It's free. That's why you now have fixed pricing. So lovely uh, invention uh, made our lives a lot better as far as that goes. Okay. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the World Wide Web.